Hello, everyone, and welcome to our open house. My name is Michael Moyes, and I'm a student advisor here at Berkeley Music, the online division of the Berkeley College of Music. And today, as you all know, we're here to talk about music supervision with Brad Hatfield. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to have about 20 minutes where Brad's going to talk a little bit about music supervision. I'm going to field, uh, or I'm going to ask him a few questions here and there. And after that, we're going to open it up to questions for you guys. So while we're doing this, you can keep typing questions to us, and I'll rel relay some of those to Brad uh, once we wrap up, and we'll go from there. So I'd like to introduce Brad. Uh, Brad Hatfield is an Emmy Award-winning uh, songwriter. He is a composer and experienced music supervisor, as all of you know. He's also a professor here at Berkeley, as well as at Northeastern. Uh, pianist for the Boston Pops, so the list just kind of goes on and on. Uh, his music is heard on such movies like Analyze This, Borat, Iron Man 2, as well as TV shows like The Sopranos, ER, Saturday Night Live, Six Feet Under. Um, when he's not teaching at all of these different colleges and teaching with us at Berkeley Music, he's also the co-composer for the series Rescue Me on FX. And he tells me he also has a new pilot for NBC called The New World. Yeah. So to get started, uh, Brad, what does a music supervisor do exactly? Ah, uh, it's a big juggling act. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. It's uh, actually great to be here and uh, be able to talk about this. It's, it's a huge topic, and I hope we can get to everything. Uh, there's so much to be said. The main points of a music supervisor is that you're in the middle of the, the content providers, the people that make the music that TV, film, uh, any sort of media that uses music in any sort of way that needs to be licensed. So the music supervisor really stands in the middle of all this. So you've got the content providers and then you've got the producers of the TV shows, the films, the video games, um, even uh, environments that, that you walk into where music is piped in. Uh, uh, they, they have to have somebody that's got the network and the set of skills to license that music and also make it a good fit for the producers and s help brand the show or make the scene very believable. So it requires an awful lot of knowledge of lots of different kinds of music. Uh, you would think and you would hope, boy, can't we just pick our favorite stuff and say, hey, try this. But most jobs require that you have to follow along with where the show is going and if there's a flashback suddenly you have to do music from the 50s or the 60s or 1920s. So it's like Boardwalk Empire, a great example of that. Mm. And at the same time you get the movies like uh, that Alex Patsavas works on where you've got the latest breaking indie acts. So um, it really covers a wide gamut. Besides that basic thing of the creative uh, suggestion of music that's going to work for the producers and the licensing of all that. There's a lot to be dealt with within relationships of all the layers of folks that you're answering to and also the folks that you're communicating with to make sure that all these licenses uh, get executed properly and all the rights owners are, are tied in. So you have to have some pretty good personal skills and uh, you need to remain calm because things get a little tense, especially in TV where we have a really short uh, turnaround um, for needs of the music and, and folding it in. Um, a degree of knowledge about the technical uh, parts of, of music, even just sample rates and uh, uh, bit depth and things like that when you're accepting uh, music that comes in, even though that usually falls to the music super, uh, music editor's uh -huh. um, uh, degree. It's, you'll be surprised how many times a music editor becomes a music supervisor or a producer becomes a music supervisor. I just feel like you have to know everybody's job in this sort of post-production world and you have to be able to communicate well uh, with them, be able to listen and find out what they need and then, then go get it and mm. tidy it up. You mentioned uh, licensing is a pretty important part, and you also mentioned a lot of old songs. How often mm -hmm. uh, does it happen that you've got a great song that fits perfectly, but it gets pulled because the rights are, aren't cleared? Right, and there's a, a variety of reasons that that happens. Uh, a previous pilot that I did, uh, The End of Steve with Matthew Perry, uh, Bud Carr, that's two D's and two R's, uh -huh. one of the supreme music supervisors, was one of two music supervisors on that show. 
but uh, for this pilot, but they put in a Coldplay tune, and it was just sort of unclearable. But what it did do is for the directors and the producers give them a feel of what the music uh, should be like for this show. Okay. So as a composer, I basically had to do what often happens. Well, get me something that sounds like that. So uh, why can't you license? Sometimes it's, uh, it's prohibitive because of the money. It's just um, way more than the budget will allow. Um, sometimes it's the one rights owner, and you'll find this with rap music, especially where there's a lot of master recordings that are incorporated in the recording that you're, you're trying to license. Mm -hmm. So not only are you going to the main master owner, uh, might be a record label, uh, but also the publisher. Uh, if there are several writers on there, you need to clear it with all those writers. But if there's several masters in there, then, then that puts another layer of complexity. So sometimes you just physically can't get to all those rights owners quickly enough. And to take a risk of putting in a piece of music in a feature film that's going to be very visible, that has a loose end mm -hmm. in it, they just don't want to do it. So if somebody has 1.3% of the publishing or a writer's share, they're just not going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, Another reason that you may not be able to clear is that the director or the producer or whoever's the showrunner uh, has placed this music in there. They've all fallen in love with it. It's called Temp Love. It sits in there long enough. It's working, it's working, it's working. Um, and uh, they, they get in touch with the rights owners and the rights owners go, so what's this about? Uh, and you say, well, it's a movie about this. Okay, and what's the scene it's going to be in? And they describe the scene. They say, well, I don't want my music into that scene. So it might be because of that rights owner just doesn't want their music associated with whatever the dialogue was, whatever the actors were doing, whatever the big intent of the film is. Um, when you license music for performance and in sync with uh, other media, you're combining, you're taking that music and you're adding it in. Um, so you have to get sync rights. Mm -hmm. So that's different than if you want to record somebody's song and make a CD and you just want to do a cover. You go to Harry Fox Agency and you're basically doing a cover. Now sometimes some publishers want to say who's doing it, right. what are you doing to it. Uh, they may they may say, uh, okay, you can do it, but it's going to cost you a lot more than the statutory rate. Uh, but it gets a little more complex when you're licensing uh, for sync because you really are blending two things together. And uh, that gets to be the tricky part. So that's when building great relationships with master owners and big publishers that represent a lot of uh, artists, writing artists, um, rights owners, I think is a, probably the shortcut to say there. So having a great network with those folks will probably ease your licensing process. But when you're first getting started, uh, you just have to really bear down and do whatever you can do to convince that rights owner that this is like the best possible right. placement yeah. of their music. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the point of getting started, uh, mm -hmm. I'm a composer. A lot of the people that are watching this are probably composers. You're a composer. Mm -hmm. What's a good way to get your music out there um, particularly what I'm thinking of is music libraries. It right. Is trying to get your music placed in a music mm -hmm. library a good place to start for a, a budding composer? Right. There's so much to be said about music libraries. They've changed so much over the years. It used to be literally a library that lived at the network, and there was a guy there with a bunch of LPs, and the show producers would come down and say, I need some music, I need some dramatic stuff for this big breakup scene. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was literally a, a guy that would go, oh, I'll try this. Uh, my good friend Paul Antonelli, who's a music supervisor, loads of daytime stuff, uh, um, great guy. And that's how he got his start as a music supervisor, was working in a music library. Well, it's completely evolved because everything's moved on to the, to the net now. Uh -huh. And um, what used to be CDs uh, that were cataloged and all described and all edited, and um, it was up to the businesses to go out there and find these producers that were working on stuff and say, hey, get, you know, use our library. Uh, now there are like hundreds of thousands of pieces of music out there. So the word about music libraries are, or song catalogs, if I'm going to be a little more shishi about it, um, is that if you're going to take a stab at that, you want to affiliate yourself with a library that has some kind of a bar that you have to get over before you get in. If you just 
put your music up to a place that's a digital shelf, mm -hmm. maybe somebody stops by. But if that digital shelf is also filled up with a lot of rejects and cutouts, as it were, right. uh, anybody that really is interested in the music that might be in your genre, that where you're categorized, uh, are going to just go, eh, I don't think so, and they're not going to go back. So I guess the advice is to uh, budding composers and songwriters is to research these libraries. Um, and I believe there's one called musiclibraryreports.com, I believe that's correct, uh, that does list a lot of reviews um, from songwriters and composers that have had placements or not had placements or how they dealt with the, the uh, company. And that will give you some sort of information. But you really want to uh, get aligned with somebody that has incentive to place your music, which means they make money when you make money. Mm -hmm. So my publisher makes more money than I do when my things get placed. There's that little admin fee that they have there. So they always make more money than I do. But you know what? I don't care because I'd rather make 50% uh, or 45% of something than 100% of nothing. And each time you do get placed, it makes you more visible. Yes, you can throw it on your website. I've had these placements. And yeah. so it gives you a little more street cred, and it also gives you more experience, because if you do get a chance to hear the music, once it's placed, you'll hear what they do to it and, uh, and what works really well or w adjustments that they have made to it, either EQ or editing, to make mm -hmm. it work better for the scene. So you become a better writer uh, once the things actually get placed. So it's a very crowded field. Mm -hmm. uh, big advice is write the best stuff you possibly can do. Record it really well. Um, don't put anything out there that you can't completely get behind. Um, it's, it really just has to be outstanding. And if you mm -hmm. check out these uh, other libraries and listen, check out the other, uh, the other songs that are in the same genre, if you can beat it or meet it, then you're going to be able to oh, play. That's really good advice. Yeah. Very good. Um, Kind of going back to what Music Supervisor do, does, you listed a whole bunch of different players involved. What are some of the challenges of working with people like producers, people in post-production, uh, executive producers? So it is a never-ending challenge. And uh, every show is different. Uh, shows that have been around for a while that they keep the same sort of team together. They have their own way of, of communicating. Uh, they. That, that makes it work because nobody can waste time and, and you can't be chasing your tail, not when the turnaround is basically one week. On a TV show we have one week. Mm -hmm. I, get, I get footage maybe on a Sunday night and uh, they're on the mix stage the following Monday um, and I don't get spotting notes from them officially until maybe the Tuesday and then mm -hmm. you write, record, submit try to get the stuff to the music editor. So things work really quickly. Communication breakdowns are just your worst enemy. Mm -hmm. So um, you have to listen and you have to ask questions. Um, when you are talking, when you're not listening, <laughs> you're asking questions. And when, when they're answering your questions, you're actually listening instead of thinking about the next thing you're going to say. Uh, this is actually something we cover in the course, uh, the whole uh, communication as well as negotiate, uh, negotiating. Um, huge, huge parts. And it's not just music supervision, it's just post-production and production in general. Um, uh, negotiating licensing fees, but also negotiating with what piece of music are you going to pitch mm. to the producer who loves this, but the director loves this, and the actor who is an executive yeah. producer is saying, ah, wait a minute, I, I got this thing here that I want to use. I've been on shows where you're literally in the middle. so. Advice is don't offer one solution. You might combine those two things and say, here's a combination of those two. But it's always best uh, if you're in the middle of one of these polarized situations to come up with two or three other solutions and point out uh, the value of, of both of the person's uh, positions that, that are bringing it in. So communication is important. Listening is important. Uh, and being creative that is, is important too, that, that you try to think outside of the box and um, um, don't get too set on one thing because sometimes you just can't have that one thing and you've got right. to move on. Right. Um, kind of looking towards the future, new methods of licensing music online are emerging all the time. You think it's still going to be kind of difficult to find quality music um, as that approaches? Well, I'll tell you, because of things are moving so digitally, uh, there's all kinds of watermarks and, and uh, um, other methods of tagging uh, this data. Um, 
that is going to make it a little bit easier to find things. Now, once we get to the quality of it, that's a different different deal, but tracking and finding. Um, there are a lot of folks out there that are making music that could probably work. And if the price is zero dollars, it might work for certain kind right. of productions. Uh, competition is a little crazy right now, and um, there are still huge fees that are being paid out to major rights owners uh, because they're just huge songs, um, and uh, they have a lot of appeal. Um, I think that 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 there there are going to be methods, and mainly it's going to come down to publishers that are forging exclusive relationships. I think right now we're in a total wild west where we have a lot of third-party publishers. Um, there's the thing going on now where we as composers can write something called I Walk Down the Street and I own that. Mm. I own the publishing, I own the, the, the writership on that. I can license it to a, a third-party publisher or make it available for licensing. Make them the admin. Uh, if they call it yesterday I Walk Down the Street Mm -hmm. Now they attach their publishing to it. Uh, I can also send it to another library or a catalog, and they can say, I walk down the street all day long. They attach their publishing to it. It's the same exact song yeah. in three different places. I, I think that one thing is going to clear out is that producers and music supervisors are getting kind of overwhelmed with, we put out an APB, we need this kind of a song coming out of a jukebox in the Midwest in 1972 and you get 15 songs come in and seven of them are the same song but seven wow. different titles. So I do believe that things have to get, they're going to get squashed down a little bit. I, I, I'm a firm believer in the strong will survive and that good quality music will move forward. I think that there's, uh, I think in the, the good part of this, Michael, is that I think we're going to challenge ourselves to make the best music possible and, and produce it. Uh, to a higher level and those folks are going to punch through. There's a load of, of uh, places where music that's okay, way in the background, mm -hmm. it's going to totally work fine. It just fuels that little reality show scene to get right. from here to there, right. totally fine. As far as new kinds of licensing, uh, MTV's doing something that's really radical but it's working for a certain segment. Um, Normally, for a sync license, you would get it approved, this song for this scene, this particular usage, um, and you're paid a fee for that, and you split the fee between master owner and, and uh, publisher, representing mm -hmm. the writer, and uh, off you go. But MTV has got an expanding network with loads of shows. It's not just about, obviously, VJs anymore. It's all yeah. about all the reality shows that use a ton of music, right. a ton of music of people we've never heard of except now we hear about them, they're not getting paid any licensing fees. But what they are getting is that screen crawl at the bottom. Right, I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And uh, usually the name of the artist, the song, mm -hmm. usually where you can download it from as well. You go to MTV's site for that particular show, this particular episode, bing, 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 bing. These are all the songs that were used there. Here's a direct link to the artist's website or iTunes or Amazon mm -hmm. to download. So that's your revenue stream. So it'll be interesting to see if that ever recovers because it, it is a zero dollar deal right now. Right. Uh, and it's blanket meaning that they can use that song in any MTVN uh, network uh, programming and anything. And that's the deal you oh, sign. Oh, I didn't realize that. Oh, yeah. absolutely. That's what makes it so unique. It's not just the one show, that one thing. They basically say if you sign this over to us for the sum of one dollar and do consideration, uh -huh. promotional consideration, um, that we're free to do this. It drives more people to the live venues when yeah. you go because the recognition is there. You are going to sell more. Um, it's a different way of doing business. I can only see more things like that happening. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the bottom line is you do have to be a good negotiator, and I think you have to do what's fair, but you also have to do what works for you. Um, all these deals are non-exclusive mm -hmm. uh, while they're in force, so you can usually get out of them. After a certain point, you can pull the plug and say, I've, I got a record deal. Right. The folks that just signed all my material are not into this. Yeah. So the, uh, you've got ex, you know, there's there's a way out of these kinds of agreements. But for being visible and getting on the map, hey, I had my I had my song in uh, Jersey Shore, whatever. Sure, sure, sure. So then now you've got a little credit. So that awesome. Helps. Well, if you're okay, we've got some good questions that have been coming okay. in. If we can ask them from sure, the, uh, absolutely from the students over there, uh, David Ashford. Um, has this question, I want to offer songs and music tracks within a stylistic format. 
Uh, what are your thoughts on going through a music publisher or going direct to a supervisor? Right, right. If you go directly to a music supervisor, here's the thing, uh, Alex Patsavas, and by the way, I have loads of interviews uh, with folks like uh, Lindsay Wolfington from uh, One Tree Hill and Alex Patsavas, who is the queen of music, reigning queen of music supervision mm -hmm. right now. Uh, also, uh, some daytime folks. Um, I, I've got loads of interviews with folks, and uh, they talk about how they like to see the music coming in. Alex prefers hard copy. She likes CDs mailed to her, but if you're going to submit to her, she wants to know that you're submitting music that works for the shows that she's working on. Um, uh, so you can't just send really good music that has nothing to do with the shows that she's got going. Uh, if you see, see that she's in pre-production uh, on a new show uh, and you want to pitch to that, um, that often happens. When Boardwalk Empire was coming up on the grid, believe me, there was a lot of music from the 1920s and 30s that was being written and pitched directly to the show, uh, as well as through a publisher. So I don't really have um, great advice for you in terms of which way you can go through because there are a lot of people pursuing it. Most of the stuff does get listened to by different music supervisors. I would spend time and money reading about those music supervisors as much as you possibly can to get a feel for how they like to see stuff come in. Um, knowing somebody that can get, get the music to them, especially somebody that has incentive, like a publisher or a song catalog, makes it much better. Uh, that's a better messenger to have, somebody that's going to actually profit if they, if they actually get it placed. So you can certainly take both avenues, but what you don't want to do, what you never want to do, is if you're working with a publisher or a song catalog and pitching to a music supervisor, please don't go around them and also pitch to the music supervisor directly. That's just bad form, and you really don't want to do that. You can place your thing, uh, your music with several different catalogs with these retitle schemes. I mean, that, that is an avenue. Maybe only one or two of them can actually get to that music supervisor. And that's fine because you've leveled the playing field. It's a non-exclusive deal. But what you don't want to do is uh, cut in front of the line of yourself. And uh, that makes the publisher very unthrilled. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it does. Got a, another good question from Melissa. Would you prefer to be able to license instantly from a song catalog or music library uh, as opposed to dealing with negotiating sync fees. Right, right. This is the, this is the incredible thing that's out there now is uh, sites uh, that build even just the mechanism, licensequote.com I believe is the name, where they actually have a bit of machinery that can live on an artist's site and they can go in there. And it's pretty much industry, I was very impressed by the rates that they were putting in there. Relatively industry standard, but the artist slash rights owner can get in there and tweak that stuff. Uh, so it works better for them. Okay, so if you do the shopping basket thing uh, and you're working on a documentary or you're working on a local TV show and you just want to get in there and you don't have a blanket license, you do need to license these things, you can literally go in there and plug and play. You can search on very specific beats per minute and instrumentation, uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, I think it's just the quality of the material that you're going to get, but um, the big recognizable songs more than likely are not going to be the plug and play, go in there and drop them in your shopping cart thing. So I think it's whatever works for the project and the budget. Um, uh, if you are dealing with bigger uh, publishers and rights owners, um, but you have a fixed budget, uh, Lindsay Wolfington uh, from One Tree Hill and Ghost Whispers. She had a weekly budget. She could um, say, all right, I got, she put an Excel spreadsheet. She'd go through the script. This is the big montage, big money here. And I think I have a couple ideas or the producer has an idea. So that's going to be the big drain. Now I've got these other things in here. They're going to cost X amount. And she'll figure out what those tunes are going to be, some good options. And then she'll sort of pre-clear them with the rights owners um, and say, hey, this is how much money I've got. Uh, to work with and um, so the, she puts the thing out there so maybe there's not a lot of negotiating uh, maybe it's she said this is what I've got I might have more and this is a good thing to have it's always better to be able to say at the end I've got more rather than less um, so I, I think every case is different just as the previous uh, question uh, there's no really one answer but the convenience of going to a trusted uh, song catalog 
sand call log or uh, library that you know there's some big ones out there first.com firstcom.com and uh, uh, other ones where you can really move through and uh, do the checkout. Hey, if the music works and it works for your budget, you're, you're in good shape. Got a good question from Alec. I work for a major record label, clearing digital and mechanical licenses, et cetera. I previously worked as a talent scout um, in A&R in the 90s. Is there any advice that you can give to him on how he can transition into a music placement or supervision role? Yeah, this is happening a lot with record labels, especially indie record labels uh, that uh, are just all over the licensing thing. Um, it's interesting, every music supervisor uh, comes into it from a different background. Um, you mentioned one thing that you had a, a you were an A and R guy in the '90s, and so you know people. And that's like the first thing that you want to be able to do is that you have somebody that you can get in contact with and say, "Hey, where are you at? What what kind of stuff do you have?" Um, I'm thinking of uh, trying to move into this area, and I'd like to be able to uh, call on you, but I'd like to know what we got going. So the more you can get a network of uh, folks together, that's going to raise your value. So if you go to an independent film or a TV show that's just getting going, or what, it, or just a f student film. You gotta get some uh, actual works and credited uh, works done to move you forward. But Alex Patsavas booked bands, uh, but she used some of the bands that she used to book into a club uh, with some of her first work. Um, uh, Lindsay Wolfington sang a cappella, and, uh, but you, uh, worked on the college radio station. Um, she made connections with uh, folks there who were, of course, looking for airplay. Mm -hmm. So it's all about how you come into it and, and who you have in your back pocket when you move forward and also the ability to really communicate with those uh, rights holders and make deals happen. Um, there's no one way in, but I say get as close to the post-production uh, part uh, of any of these projects as possible. I mean, if you can get in at the be very beginning when people are first looking at what music might work, you just have to get close to it. Um, and I think it's important that it's very clear that, that the, the course that we're, that we're running here, the music, supervisor, music Supervision Online course, is not just to turn you into a music supervisor. That, that's not the intent. The intent is to educate you about all these different things that where music uh, supervision has an impact. So whether you're a publisher or a music editor or a re-recording engineer that's um, working on the dub stage and there's no music supervisor on the project or you're a picture editor. Understanding the mechanics of all this will allow you to be able to function that way and maybe you can sort of double dip and be two different things uh, or work that into your contract. I, n I am now assuming these extra roles. So this course is really about songwriters, publishers, even directors and producers, music editors, uh, re-recording mixers, um, record companies, all these folks that need to understand how the mechanism works and what's at stake, timelines, um, sort of industry standard uh, contracts which we use throughout the course. We're using all the, the real deals. Uh, moving through a cue sheet, what needs to be on there? Uh, who makes those decisions? Who double checks them? Please, somebody check the cue sheet. Um, so that was a long answer to your question, but coming in from your background, I think it's just a great benefit, and you just have to get around productions so you can bring your assets to the table. Yeah. Just have one more quick question since we've kind of gone over the time here, if that's okay. Yeah, uh, that happens. Yeah, this one, this one is a good one. It's from Simon. Uh, what's the best place to go to find out what new shows are in production and who the music oh, yeah. supervisors are. Yeah, IMDB Pro. Um, there are other things that you can get on. Uh, Hollywood Reporter uh, has got another subscription uh, service that you can get in on, and I can't give you that URL, but uh, I believe it's that's kind of where you'd want to go. But IMDB Pro, I forget what I'm paying for that. It's 150 bucks a year, something like that. But you get great, and you get contact information because I get people calling me all the time. How do I get in touch with so and so? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, here's here's their real email. <laughs> you didn't get it from me. Uh, but if you have IMDb Pro, you're going to get a, a couple steps closer, and you'll definitely see what's in production. Uh, most of the pilots that are out there now, the one that I just worked on, was loaded with black keys. Um, music that was tempted in. That's $400,000 worth of black keys. Um, so Brad Hatfield, a little cheaper, like a lot cheaper. Um, 
but you'd go there and you'd be able to see that there wasn't a music supervisor on that show right now, as a matter of fact. And so basically, I'm composer and also consulting uh, off the grid um, for that. And um, so if you're pitching, yeah, you want to see who's on there. Whether they stay on those pilots, it's hard to say uh, and what, what goes moving forward. But um, IMDb Pro is great. It's reliable, um, really great information, uh, great industry contacts. And I believe it's Hollywood Reporter, and there's, there's something else that I'm missing. But if you take my course, if you take the music supervision course, you <laughs> this is one of the things that we do. We, we go through and we get research, and uh, because it's not just about the U.S., uh, the course, uh, it, the great part about it is that we've got a lot of folks in UK, Australia, and the Far East, South America, and they all talk about their areas and, and you know, even if it's just the PROs, the performance rights uh, organizations, uh, they all contribute great information that helps all of us uh, out. Um, so it's a changing landscape, but you want to go for the real deal mm -hmm. as much as possible. That's great. Well, thank you very much for joining us. It's, it's been an honor to to be here with Brad to talk about the course a little bit and, and more specifically talk about music supervision and everything that the whole realm entails. Yeah. Um, and like he said before, he's got that course, music supervision. There's another course that he's written uh, called Songwriting for Film and TV, which we do online as well. And I'm sure you all know all the other courses that we have on berkeleymusic.com. Thank you very much, Brad. I hope this was useful to, to the students. It was for me. Michael, this was a great pleasure. I can't thank you enough. I will tell you this. Uh, what Berkeley Music is doing online is phenomenal. There's nothing like it. Uh, incredible development team. Uh, uh, my developer, Boriana, and, and Debbie Cavalier, the, the visionary, and Dave Cusack. Uh, so many incredible folks that work on this uh, that challenge us to make this material and how it's delivered um, uh, first rate. And I'm, I'm very proud of what's going on here. So I, I hope you'll join me in the classroom. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very thank much, you. and thank all of you.